Hello everyone, now we want to talk about a few ideas before we actually start the course. And these ideas include Maxwell's equations, layers of abstraction, and digital versus analog signals. And in this video I want to mainly focus on Maxwell's equations. Uh, and if there's some time we can cover this, but if not, we can do it in later videos. Uh, so Maxwell's equations come in an integral form and a differential form. And when you use these depends on the situation. For example, if you have uh, densities or densities of charge, for example, you'll use the differential forms. And if you have uh, singular charges or singular currents going through a wire, you'll use the integral form. And I'll give you an example soon. So looking at this first law, which is Gauss's law, uh, we can review some basics before we look at these laws. Let's first look at the electric charges. So if you have a positive charge just sitting here, what do we know about this charge from physics? Well, what we know is it's going to produce, it has a property called charge. It has a mass and a charge. It's going to produce an electric field going in every direction, but we'll just use four uh, arrows to indicate that it's a vector quantity, which is the electric, electric field. And this electric field has a magnitude and a direction. In this case, we can see that, for example, from a certain distance r, given that this whole quantity, this whole uh, uh, thing is symmetric, there's no uh, higher charge density here than it is there, then we can assume that at a distance r from the center of the charge, the electric field is going to be the same magnitude every on this on this line and its radius and it's going to direct in a way that is perpendicular to the surface element dA okay so that's one way to define the electric field here so what we're going to do is now just remember so if you have a positive charge it's going to have an electric field if you bring a negative charge near it What's going to happen is that these guys are going to repel each other, and to remember, electric uh, negative charges are going to have electric fields that are going inwards. And if you bring these guys together, they're going to accelerate towards each other. And if you bring a positive charge here, it's going to repel this other positive charge. They're going to produce a force on each other. And they're going to accelerate away from each other. So, now, one other thing is if you bring negative charges close to each other, they're going to repel each other. So that covers all the cases of positive and negative charges. And remember now, there are simply charges that have opposite properties. That's why they're called positive and negative. The positive and negative are just there to allow us to do some math. They're just completely arbitrary. We could have caused this guy, called this guy positive and this one negative. But because of convention, we'll call the charge of an electron, for example, negative, and the charge of a proton, positive. So that's one thing then. And another thing we need to remember is that if you have charges that are moving in a magnetic field, so let me draw a magnetic field here. It's going this way. And we do have to remember, though, magnetic field lines end on themselves they don't you never have a net magnetic field anywhere a monopole so this guy's we're just looking at a small section of a bigger magnetic field like this right now i'm just zooming into like this part for example and here's what we're seeing right now so if you have some charge going in this direction for example with a certain velocity v what we notice is that you got to use right hand rule to see what force, what magnetic force is uh, exerted on this particle. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to use your index finger and you point your index finger in the direction of the velocity vector. And let's just see what's going to happen. The particle is going to go this way at a certain velocity. And so you point your finger in that direction to your index finger and then you point the rest of your fingers in the direction of the uh, magnetic field 
and that's going to determine your thumb is going to determine the direction of the magnetic force. Now, if the particle is as a positive charge, that's for this case it's going to be, let's see, index finger going this way, the rest of the finger is going that way. Your thumb's going into the board, so it's going to be the back of an arrow. If you think of an arrow, it's going to have a front and a back. And we're looking at it going into the board, so we're going to see this part uh, in another view. So we're going to see the back of it. It's just going to be this way. So the magnetic force is going, uh, the magnetic force is going into the board. So the particle is going to, depending on its velocity, it's going to be uh, circulating uh, into the board. So it's going to look something like this. Let me kind of reconfigure what this looks like. So you're going to have the magnetic field coming out this way and then you're gonna have the charge having that velocity V going this way which is of course gonna change as we go around it's gonna doing that and the force is gonna be exerted towards the center here it's a center seeking one and due to the presence of the magnetic field and the force is going to be the magnetic force is the amount of the charge times the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field so let's see what's going to happen so if we increase the magnetic field strength the force exerted on the charge is going to increase. Well, that makes sense. If you make this a huge magnetic field, well, it's going to have more of an effect on the moving charge, which is represented by Q here and its velocity. If you increase the velocity to a very huge amount, well, you're also going to have a, hu a bigger uh, magnetic force towards the center. And therefore, you're going to probably have a uh, tighter orbit here which I've seen is done in experiment and if you're interested I can uh, link that up later so basically if you have a low velocity here you're gonna have a, a wider orbit and if you have very high velocity you're gonna have you're gonna be very close there's gonna be higher and higher force on you and you're gonna be much closer uh, orbiting uh, I shouldn't say orbiting but you're gonna be circulating uh, much closer to the source so that's the magnetic force then and you also gotta remember that uh, magnetic materials inside of them there's electrons moving in circular somewhat circular uh, uh, paths that produce magnetic fields and when we have a magnetic field what's going to happen is suppose we have a uh, bar magnet and what happens here is, is you have a positive or a north pole and a south pole and magnetic field lines the way they produce is they start from the positive or the north and they go towards the south and on the south and if you can imagine inside they're looking like this again there's an infinite number of them but I'm only going to draw like for example two here so what's going to happen is they start here and they end on the negative side or the south side Okay, so now let's now that we have this background, let's look at the Maxwell's equations now. Looking at the first equation, it's saying that if you have some charge, and what this is called is the, I always forget if it's a permeability or per permittivity constant, basically talking about the property of the space in which there's this charge existing. So let's see, if we put a charge here, some positive charge Q and we make a closed surface around it imaginary Gaussian surface around it what's gonna happen is that we're gonna measure some electric field strength at this point for example and we have the normal to the surface vector with a magnitude of uh, 1 I believe should be for this case what you're going to do is if you sum up every single one of these guys, for example here it's going this way, dA, and I'm picking a symmetric surface uh, for ease of the mathematics of it, you could pick a surface that looks like this and the flux would be, uh, you could talk about the flux the same way but 
that's not very easy to calculate so I'm just gonna do a symmetric surface here which is a spherical spherically symmetric surface so then if you think about the electric field vector here let me do it right it's gonna be somewhat in that direction and it's gonna be the same strength at every point here if this is the same radius r from the center and if you don't have any densities laying around here it's the same single charge sitting in this uh, sitting inside here so what's gonna happen is that if you sum up all these guys if you multiply this dA times this electric field strength at this point and add them all up what you're gonna get is the electric flux meaning how much how many electric field lines pass through uh, the surface basically which is going to suggest that the, that the existence of charges in the center or somewhere inside of the uh, of the structure. So basically, if you go anywhere in the universe and you measure uh, electric field, that's going to hint at, uh, and that is a static electric field. It can't be changing. If it's sitting there and has a certain electric field, that means there must be charges inside of that closed uh, loop. So in here, then it's going to be. Here's what it's saying. If you if you take the dot product of the electric field and the little area surface area elements you take the dot product you sum them all up and that's what this integral means that's going to be proportional to the amount of charge present uh, and then inverse proportional to some constant which is the I believe should be the perm permittivity of uh, space which is just a property of the medium in which it travels through so that's going to be the total uh, electric field multiplied by the uh, surface vector A that is if you had a perfectly perpendicular uh, a surface that was perpendicular to the electric field lines like so then you could simply say the, the uh, magnitude of each of them E times A times the cosine of the angle between them well the theta is equal to zero between them, the angle between these guys. So the cosine of zero is one. So you'll simply get E times A, and that is your flux or uh, electric flux or the amount of uh, electric field lines going through a surface. And obviously, if you increase the amount of flux, you're gonna have a you're gonna have more electric field lines going through the surface. It's kind of like a sheet of paper and a blow dryer. If you have a much stronger, uh, much more power to your blow dryer, you're gonna have a stronger uh, flux of uh, blow dry going through the uh, sheet of paper so that's one way to look at it another way that I prefer in the de which is the differential form for these two first laws reason being is if you look at these guys this is saying that the divergence of the electric field the, what this is is a del operator and what it's talking about is the rate of change uh, and when you dot it do a dot product of that with a vector field uh, you'll get the density over epsilon uh, epsilon naught again, which is the same constant here. So when you have a singular charge, like we had here, it's easier to use the integral form, which is over here. But when you have some density, charge density, like for example, some blob right now, that is this shape, for example, and you want to find the uh, electric field, the divergence to the electric field, what you're going to do is use the differential form and that's saying that the divergence of the electric field is going to be del dot e and if you I don't know if you recall from vector calculus but del is by definition the rate of change in the x direction multiplied by the unit vector of x plus rate of change in the y direction times the unit vector j plus the rate of change in the z direction uh, unit vector k when we dot these guys together we get and I'm gonna write this in the same form which is uh, in a vector calculus form which is a uh, ddx partial ddy and partial ddz dotting that with the electric field which the components are going to be uh, e sub x e sub y e sub z those are the components and if you remember from uh, high school physics if you have some vector a dotted with some other vector b you're gonna have ax the components of it ax a uh, y a z 
being dotted with bx, by, bz, what you get is a sub x, b sub x plus Um, a sub y, b sub y plus a sub z, b sub z. That is the definition of a dot, a dot product for vector calculus. Of course, you could also express that in the following way. It's a matter of interpretation and uh, application. Which is if you have a here and the vector b here, and that's the angle theta. What that's going to say is the projection of A onto B, basically, which is going to be this guy, the component of A that's going in this direction, which is A sub X, for example. If that is along the X direction, that would be A sub X. It's a geometric uh, thing here. So looking at that, then, it's going to say, when we dot those together, it's going to be the same form, so multiply these guys and sum them all up. And what you get is the divergence of the electric field is going to be d dx d dy and d these are partial derivatives by the way you get e sub x e sub y and e sub z and I'll just write them in the vector calculus form in the vector notation and what this is saying it's gonna give you let's see and what you're gonna get is basically the fact that if you have some 3D coordinate system, you can think if I put some charge density here, well, we can't use the integral form because we can't just, it'll be computationally, it'll be very difficult to just sum these guys all up. So, looking at the divergence, it's saying that if you have some density of charges here, there's going to be some electric field diverging outwards. And we're not going to go through examples of calculating this in this uh, introductory video because we're just trying to make sure that we understand Maxwell's equations in a, uh, a conceptual sense and we don't necessarily need to do anything computational in this class. Uh, the whole point is to show you the difficulty in this and then try trying ways of simplifying this, uh, which is the goal of engineering, to so simplify physical, difficult physical concepts and the math of it. So what's going to happen here, let's see, we can look at the magnetic, uh, a bar magnet now, and if you again think about the magnetic flux or the field lines coming out here, I'll draw only two for the simpli simplicity. So that's what they're going to look like on the inside. So now if you look at the second equation, of the second Maxwell equation here, we see that the same form, integral form, uh, as the first law, and then we have the same divergence form in the uh, differential form here. So what this is saying is that we're getting the result of zero on the uh, magnetic flux. And let's remember though, these are fluxes. That's the electric flux, and that is the magnetic flux. Simply the number of field lines of each, guys. So here, the number of field lines of the electric field going outwards through a surface and likewise for the uh, magnetic flux. So basically, if you look at a bar magnet here, and if you draw a surface around it, first the integral form, if you think about it in that sense, what we get is some symmetric surface here. And you can see that if I sum up all the magnetic field lines, for example, one going this way right now and one going this way, and alike one going this way and one going this way, if I sum these guys up, I'm going to get a net magnetic field of zero. Well, that also makes sense because if you think about divergent, uh, being uh, divergence of a field, it's talking about how much of it is going away, diverging away, like in this case. But here we see that none of it is diverging away, it's all ending up on itself. So it makes sense that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. So what that means is that and the fact is that we never, we have never found magnetic monopoles, meaning a magnetic, uh, some kind of a bar magnet that only has a north pole and not a south pole, uh, acting in such a way like this. In that case, this law would not be true anymore if we found such a magnetic monopole. 
But until this day, this is a good approximation and this works for us. This is a true law, true abstraction of the laws of physics. So that is that law. And the next one is talking about, the third one is talking about if we have a change in the magnetic flux. So if we change the number of uh, magnetic field lines going through a given surface, that's the surface, that's the magnetic field lines. If you change these, depending on the rate of change of these guys, so D, right in a different color, D magnetic flux DT, that is going to be proportional to the E dot DR, which we found. I'm sorry, this would be the EMF, if you remember from uh, electromagnetism, or the induced voltage. So what that means is that if you change the magnetic flux through a surface, what you're going to get is you're going to induce a voltage. So I should really say it's proportional to EMF or induced voltage. So if I uh, do this on a, for example, let's see. If I have some surface here, and in, in reality this should be a loop. I apologize for it. This should be a loop. Let me make it correct now. We have to know. We can't just look at the mathematics and be able to tell everything. We got to know that how these uh, laws apply. So when we have a wire, a closed loop, loop of wire, and suppose I put a resistor here then. And if I have some magnetic flux going through this, let me draw a different view over here. We have some resistor going through this. What's going to happen is if you have a magnetic field, uh, magnetic field going through it, and if you change, so let me draw it here too, we are facing this, so it's going to look like this, the arrow pointing outwards. That's the magnetic field. So if I change the magnetic field to something like this, so if I increase it, for example, And in this case, we'd be like be like this. Depending on the rate of change of this magnet, how fast I change this magnetic field, magnetic flux, we're going to get a, a voltage that is or an EMF, electromotive force that is induced in this on this loop. And the direction of it is going to be such that it's going to resist the change in the uh, electromagnetic or the magnetic flux. In this case, it's increasing in this direction. So it's going to want to resist that increase uh, by producing a the the EMF is going to be induced in such a way to resist the change in the magnetic field. So it's going to be this way. So how do you produce that? Well, the right hand rule says uh, the magnetic field the change must be going this way. So the voltage is induced so that the current goes in this direction. So it could be a positive and negative across this resistor EMF going in this way and that is going to resist the change in the magnetic uh, flux so that's another thing to remember that's what this is talking about and another key thing is and in this case yeah, you can see that the curl now the curl of the uh, electric field is going to be proportional to the uh, change in the magnetic field basically so basically what these two laws are saying is that if you change magnetic fields and electric fields uh, you're gonna you're gonna produce the corresponding field. So if you change the electric field, you're going to produce a, a magnetic field and vice versa. And this last law is talking about uh, what happens if um, you have a current going. So you have some current going through a wire. Whoops, went too low here now. If you have some wire here, and you have a current flowing. You're gonna what what that means is that you're going to then this is a steady current meaning it's not changing. What you'll be doing is that you'll be producing a magnetic field like so, and you can follow the right hand rule and you'll see that if you point your thumb in the direction of the current, so that's your thumb going in this direction, your fingers will be going this way like that. So that is going to be magnetic field going this way.
produced as a result of the existence of this current going that way. So this circulation, as Maxwell called it, is basically, let's go back here to the equation, Maxwell equation up here. It's be proportional to the amount of current flowing times these constants that we're not going to worry about here. But the idea is that it's going to be proportional to the current and the rate of change of the electric uh, flux. And that kind of applies to capacitors because this was kind of unexplainable. Unexplain For the longest, it used to be uh, that the that this was proportional to mu naught i and they didn't have this portion of it and what that applies to is it's called the displacement current this is called the displacement current and it tries to explain what happens when you have like a circular plate of a capacitor and if you have a current going here and positive charges and also negative charges on the opposite side what's gonna happen is you're gonna have an electric field going this way and what this attempts to do is to explain what happens from the current that's going this way to the one that's going this way what's happening between this transition so this is this displacement current is explaining that the rate of change of the electric field the electric flux in the capacitor is going to uh, be the displacement current that is added to the original current here. So the whole idea here is that these four laws are going to explain every electric and magnetic phenomena that are related to charges uh, in the universe that we have observed so far. So now in the next video we're going to see how our abstractions are going to simplify these equations and they're going to make it so that we don't need these equations every time we want to do a simple engineering calculation. I'm way overdue in this video, so I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.